Revelation 22, the last chapter in the last book, because next week what we're going to do is the entire book in chronological order of how the prophecies actually lay out. Well, we've then been going through it. We have seen it. We jump back and forth, back and forth in time. Okay, now I'm putting it together actually in chronological order. But today is Revelation 22, the last chapter. The first six verses of chapter 22 actually belong to chapter 21. Now we have to remember the fact that the chapter divisions and the verse divisions are not part of scripture. Those were added later. Thankfully they were because it does make it a whole lot easier for us to find things, but those things are not scripture in and of themselves. So the vision that John saw of heaven and the things we talked about last week about heaven, we're going to continue on with that for the first six verses. And then the verses from, chapter, from verse 7 to the end is more or less the epilogue. The kind of summing it up and all, all of these other things that come with the end of the end of the chapter. Or of actually of the entire book. So anyway, starting with verses 1 and 2. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of the street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Notice this river is coming from the throne of the Lamb. Water, life-giving. Water is used so often as a symbol of giving of life because we are so totally dependent upon water. You take away water, we die. Matter of fact, you take away water, we cease to exist with a little pile of dust. Um, but So water is really important from a life, but that life is flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, Jesus. That's where that life is flowing from clear as crystal coming down from the throne. Okay, clear. In other words, pure. In the middle of the street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. Now remember, in the Garden of Eden, there was a tree of life. But they were not, Adam and Eve, after they sinned, were not allowed back into the garden because they were not allowed access to this tree. Now this tree of life isn't necessarily a physical tree. And this river, as with the river, isn't a necessarily a physical river. It is life-giving. Well, the, the, the tree, yeah, you know, it's, it's just, as, as it's not God as it is the power of God. Well, probably the way I would explain it. Um, but it's coming down the middle of the street. Okay, now why would you put a river in the road? I remember uh, years ago when going through some town, I forget where it was at, they literally had this creek that ran through town and they ran it right down the middle of the street. They, just, they decided that, well, it was going to be too costly to uh, dig culverts or put drains in. Um, so they just literally tapered the street down. And when the water was high, you rode on the sides. And when it was low, then you had more space. Um, but that creek ran right down through town. I mean, literally through the middle of town town. Um, but this is kind of that mindset. It is the way, the life and the way. And yielding its fruit every month, again, our 12, it shows up here. The tree is for the healing of the nations. It is, we are healed. We are healed from the power of sin and of death. It's the healing. Ezekiel, way back, talked about almost the exact same thing. In chapter 47, by the river on its bank on one side and on the other will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because their water flows from the sanctuary and their fruit will be for the food and for the leaves for healing. Do you see the, how close these two things are? This prophecy, and if you actually go back and read Ezekiel 47, and look at the whole chapter, it really is talking about the same thing. In Revelation 2, 7, 
And then actually in every letter to the churches, there was one line that was always there. And it said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Going all the way back to the beginning, before we started talking, we said we were talking about the churches themselves, the seven churches. But that line that says, he who has an ear to hear, that was used with every one of the churches. But I will grant to eat of the tree of light, which is in the paradise of God. Now, this vision that we are looking at now is quite often referred to as paradise, but we're going to see how it is not the old paradise and how the old paradise actually was lacking. Right. Was lacking. We never think of it that way because it was perfection. It was the perfect place. There couldn't have been anything. See, but before the fall, it still was lacking. That helps us to understand why the fall is part of God's plan. It really was. In 1 Corinthians 15, which is also very much a chapter about things to come in the resurrection. So also it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, so also are those who are earthly. As for the heavenly, so are those who are heavenly. Okay, that's an awful lot, and it almost sounds confusing. It's talking about Adam was earthly. He was from the earth. Jesus was heavenly because he's from heaven. That's really all that it's saying right here. It goes a long way around about to say it all, but it, that's what it's saying. And then the last verse. Just as we have bore the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Just as we are created and we bear that image of being human beings, when Jesus rose from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven, he was glorified. That glory that came upon Jesus also will come upon us in that time. Once we are resurrected. So the heavenly and the earthly are going to remain in certain senses. Well, because we're going to bear the image of the heavenly. But we still are not necessarily going to lose the image of the earthly. But we will change, be changed, and that change, exactly what that is, Scripture doesn't tell us. And it doesn't tell us because we couldn't understand it, even if it did. In John 7, 37 to 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Same symbolism being used, but explained here now. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit had not been yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit had not come yet when Jesus spoke these words. But he's talking about the coming to life in the spirit when he's talking about the river the water of life he's talking about the holy spirit he's not talking about this liquid stuff he explains that and he says this is what i'm speaking of. i'm speaking of the spirit of god the holy spirit that is going to come upon you and that came at pentecost and that same holy spirit is available to each of us Verse 3 and 4. And there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Now we've had some of this stuff before. No longer any curse. Remember at the fall, not only 
was Adam and Eve cursed, not only was the serpent cursed, but so was all of creation. All of creation received the curse. Talking about the thorns and the thistles that would come up and the sweat that would be required in order to till the ground. There was no longer this readily available food. You're going to have to work for it. It's part of the curse. But the earth itself, all of creation itself, is living under the curse. And it is longing also to be relieved from that. And that's why there will be a new heaven and a new earth because the earth creation now is under the curse and it must be done away with. That's all part of the curse. The famines, all of this is all part of the curse. Disease, um, mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, okay. All, all of these things are part of the curse. Now, it, you know, and, that, and that's why you might say we talk about when something dastardly happens and people throughout the ages has always talked about it as this is a punishment from God. No, it's a natural reaction of creation because it's under the curse. Earthquakes are a natural reaction of being under the curse as our tornadoes, as our floods, as our droughts. All of these things are just the natural occurrence of a creation existing under the curse. No, it's not. It's not, it's not anybody punishing. It's just the way it is right now because the curse is there. But that's a really good question. That's a good question. So it is, it, it really falls into the be, probably the best way to explain it. It almost sounds flippant, but it's nobody's fault other than sin. Is that yeah, it's the woman's fault. But, uh, <laughs> now that, 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 that was a joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then I love that line, they will see his face. Okay? No one has seen the face of God and lived. Uh -huh. We had the same thing before. We talked about the, the, having the name on the forehead and on the hand. We had it with the beast, those who are the mark of the beast. And we looked at it and it wasn't a physical mark. It wasn't a physical name. The forehead being the head, the brain, the thought, the mind, these things. Our, all of our mind will be focused on God. That's, it's not a literally a, where you're going to take out a magic marker and write a name on it. It's the doing. It's, 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 the hand is the doing. The hand is talking about doing. It's not talking about this chip implanted. Now, if a chip gets implanted at some time in the future, that's possible. But that's really not what it's talking about. Now, if anybody, regardless of what belief they have, if it isn't belief in Jesus, they will go to hell. Re, re. so it's not the name of religion you call yourself it's where your faith is if it is in Jesus and Jesus alone your destination is heaven if it's in anything else then it's hell there is no in between it's one or the other does that answer your question okay another good question I like those Because curses the ground because of you. We talked about that. So what is missing in the first paradise? What was missing? Do you know all these things we learned about heaven, especially last week? None of those were obtainable in paradise. 
there was nothing about what we talked about heaven last week when we looked at what it was and how we will live and all this none of that was available to Adam and Eve in paradise it wasn't you see the glory of life that we will achieve in Christ far exceeds that of what Adam and Eve ever had or were ever able to get they would have lived in a and we would have lived in this wonderful glorious garden um, and things would have been really really wonderful and we would have been communing with God but there was a whole lot more that God had for his people there was a whole lot more see in the garden of Eden there was a tree that tree of knowledge of good and evil was there so temptation existed in heaven there is no such thing right it will never exist in heaven it will never exist anymore so the garden of Eden was never the destination no it wasn't it wasn't like God said I got this great plan okay and I'm going to create these human beings and we're going to place them in the garden and it is just going to be wonderful and then they sin and I said oh no I can't believe that they did that <laughs> he knew exactly what was going to happen before he created us that was all it, that was all part of his plan but now but stop and think everything God does is for his glory everything it's always for his glory it is not for our glory it's for his what brings greater glory to God a creation that serves him because they know no other way or a creation that serves him because they want to it does bring more glory to God that was his plan He's going to have a people of his own, or we are of his own possession because we want to. We desire to. So he made a way for that because it brings more glory to God. See, because in Christ, we have the church is victorious. It never will not be. It's incorruptible, which means in heaven there won't be the ability to become corrupt. It won't exist anymore. It won't have the ability to become immoral because that won't exist anymore. It will always be heavenly because we want to, not because we're forced to. Verse 5, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need for light of the lamp, or the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the last verse of the vision. This is where we end with the vision that had taken place all the way back to the beginning. This is it. This is the end of that part not just light in the sense of light but light in the sense of knowledge because we will have a knowledge that far exceeds that we have now because the power of God will illuminate us think of it as a knowledge thing as opposed to the sun shining or turning on a light the light that comes from knowing right see that's it's the same symbolism that's being used here it's not talking about the Sun and the moon and all of these those we don't know again because this creation is gonna be so different but the knowledge part is what we were going to have that is going to grow and that is going to grow and I think it's gonna grow forever I don't, I don't think it's gonna be that we are going to have all knowledge immediately I think we'll actually be continuing to learn. Now, I can't prove that from Scripture. So this becomes, some of the stuff becomes kind of a personal opinion. And, um, and don't cash that in. That's not worth anything. 
Okay, my opinion is worth what, I, what you paid for it. Nothing. But there are things that we can see. So as we come to the end now of the vision of heaven, now we go into the epilogue part, starting with verse 6. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Now that should almost be a familiar verse. Because if we go back to Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angels to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Going all the way back to the beginning, now at the end we have almost the exact same set of words. Because it is totally tying it together. It is showing that everything that was said in the beginning, at the beginning of the book, to this part of the end of the visions, are one unit. They are all tied together. This is all about the revelation of Jesus Christ. The entire book of Revelation is about Jesus. It's about Jesus' work. Jesus' work from creation all the way to the glories of heaven. That's the time period that Revelation covers. Because it is revealing to us, that's what Revelation means, to reveal, to bring back the curtain, to open up, to be able to see, to be able to understand Jesus. That's what the book is about. And then the other thing that always keeps coming up, and it's always wondered about, for the time is near. Well, I mean, it was 2,000 years ago. I mean, come on. Near? For each and every one of us, the time is near. None of us could be here next week. The time is near. So to think that, well, it's been a long, long time. No, it hasn't. We think of time differently and you know it's and it is you know I say we talk about the you know the the passage that talks is that uh, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day and you know these things i don't think that really is that's part of it part of the understanding but it's also part of it is understanding the fact that we don't know when our time first Well, see, with God, time is irrelevant. See, because he is omnipresent, omnipresent simply means that God can be at every place at every time, at the same time. Now, he is the only one that has that ability. Satan doesn't have that. The demons don't have that. They can only be in one place and one time at a time, just like us. But God is not bound by time. Verses 7 through 9. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of the book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down and worshipped at the feet of the angel who showed these, these things. And he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. Two things in here. First John is so overwhelmed by what is going on that he literally falls down to worship the angel. Now he did that once before. He did that before in chapter 19. We'll take a look at that in a minute. But I want, this says, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren, the prophets. Now John was an apostle. But the angel is saying, that you are brothers of the prophets. He is taking the Old Testament and the New Testament and tying them together. Because it's the apostle and the brethren of the prophets. 
and those who heed the words. In other words, all believers worship God. That is the only one we may worship. We may never worship anyone or anything else but God. In Revelation 19.10, where we have the other instance. Then I fell to his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. See, here he didn't tie together the old and the new, but he tied together the fact of worship God, God alone. Verses 10 and 11. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of the book, this book, for the time is near. Again, we got the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. That is a really confusing two verses. Is he telling us that if you've got sinners out in the world, just let them continue to be sinners? Where he talks about what the... Wicked, still be wicked. Let the righteous still be righteous. This will continue on to the end of history of these two things going on. Because there is a factor that is part of the play of what needs to happen before time ends. Every one of the elect, every one of the chosen of God, every one who is coming to the Father through Jesus Christ must be born and be saved. All the rest need to build up the sin to the point in which God's judgment is mandatory now because the sin bowl is full. The cup comes full of the iniquities of the world. These two things will happen at the same time basically. This is why we don't know when the time is. Because we don't know when that fullness will come. There have been other instances in Scripture where God has withheld judgment because the iniquity has not reached that fullness point yet. So when this past chapter, this, these two verses are talking about let the wicked still be wicked, let the just still be just and righteous, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about that both will reach their fullness. And they will both reach their fullness in the time that God has ordained it to happen. And men will do that of their own free will. Isn't that an amazing God? That he can actually do that? Prophesy that and fulfill that? He is an amazing God. Verses 12 and 13, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. And I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am coming quickly. Is this coming? Quickly. Again, we've talked about that. My reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. So as long as we do lots of good works, we're okay. No, the reward is with him, because we will be rewarded for the things we do in Christ there will be a reward in there. He talks about his Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, because he has no beginning, he has no end. We saw that again in Revelation chapter 1. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Way back then it was, I am, I was, I am coming. The beginning, the middle, the end. Is always there. In 20, chapter 21, verse 6, almost the same thing. And he said to me, it is done. This is coming, the end is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. Our salvation is free. We can't pay for it. We can't earn it. It's free. It's a free gift of God. Back to our chapter, verses 14 through 16. Blessed are those who wash their robes, wash your robes, to wash away our sins in the blood of the Lamb, so that they may have the right to the tree of life. 
It is a right that we are given, we don't earn. And may enter by the gate into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers, the immortal persons, the murderers, the idolaters, and anyone who loves and practices lying. Lying is always brought up in the midst of these lists. Satan is the father of lies. If we are liars, we are following the dictates of the evil one. I, Jesus, has sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. How can you be the root and the descendant? Because the root comes first, the descendant comes later, because he's the Alpha and the Omega. That's why. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. Remember, the bride is the bride of Christ, is us, the church. Come, and let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Our salvation is free. The one who wishes, the one who chooses themselves of their own free will to come. Because it's free. In each of the letters, again, to the seven churches that had that line in there, he owes an ear to hear, let him hear. It's the Spirit of God that is the ears to hear. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside of us that gives us the ability to hear the words of God and to understand them. Without the Holy Spirit, Scripture has no meaning. This is why Satan allowed for Jesus to die on the cross. Had he understood scripture, because the prophecies were all there, he would have done everything in his power to see to it that Jesus did not die. Because he didn't realize that him influencing people and causing Christ to die on the cross, as was prophesied, was his defeat. He couldn't stop it, but he, he didn't have a desire to stop it because he thought he was winning. Because he does not have the ability to understand Scripture. Verses 18 and 19, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of God, the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. In other words, it is revelation of what it is talking about directly, but I think it actually applies to all the others. Um, my, here again, this particular passage, this thing here, is talking about revelation. Uh, very clear in the context in the text. Um, but I think by extension, it actually goes to all of Scripture. Um, because all of Scripture is the Word of God. It is God-breathed. Um, you know, like in Timothy, you know, it's, it, it's, its purpose is for instructing, for building up, um, you know, in righteousness. So I think tying that in it does make it kind of carry on to the rest, but if you want to take just what is said and just the context that is saying it, it's only talking about the book of Revelation. I agree with that. It is very, very dangerous for us to add to the Word of God. It is very, very dangerous for us to take away from the Word of God. To say, well, I don't like that part. I think that really doesn't apply to me. Um, we may not do that. The last two verses. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I am coming quickly. Again, that line of quickly, of now, of hurry, all of these things carry through. It's always talking about, don't wait. You won't have time. You can't decide later. I'm coming quickly. Come, Lord Jesus. This should be our call. This should be our desire. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. That's how John ends. 
because it's all about grace of Jesus. That's the first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The last verse, it is the grace of the Lord Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And then that last little word, amen. With this, I agree. Or so let it be, is what it means. That word has a meaning. We use it in our prayers all the time, and uh, you know we always kind of end it because it's kind of that magical word that we have to put at the end of the prayer, otherwise the prayer won't get anywhere. You know, it's kind of like the postage stamp. The postage stamp of our prayers is amen. Well, it's not really a postage stamp. It really is my heart's desire is for everything I have said are in tune with you, God. So any part of my prayer that is not in tune with you, ignore it. Throw it away. Now, there's times when we might probably, when we use that principle, our prayers, he takes it and does what we asked, throws it all away because there wasn't a bit of it that was in tune with him. But he does hear our prayers. And he does purify our prayers from Romans 8. We learned that. So it is, amen.